What is the purpose of your science project? That's a super important question because if you don't know, nobody else knows either. The purpose of a science project is to add knowledge or to verify what is known about a topic. Now, sometimes your science fair instructions may say, what is the hypothesis of your project? A hypothesis is a guess about the outcome of your project. Well, you know what? I'm gonna say this. Guess what? You don't know the outcome of your project. So a hypothesis is an unrealistic expectation. You don't wanna to try to outguess your project before you've done the project. So think of your project in terms of a question. What can I do to answer a question about nature or whatever you're studying? That's what you wanna do. You don't wanna guess what you're gonna find out. You wanna pose a scenario for what you're going to find out. Now, simple experiments. Let's look at those first. Most science fair projects are based on simple experiments. When I went to Brazil for NASA uh, on one of these trips, I was very curious about the effect of smoke on the growth of plants. So I went to Walmart and I bought one of these plastic gardens. It's about the same size as this solar panel. This, so this charges my telephone and this charges my cameras. It's about this size. It has uh, 25 or 30 little cups. And those cups uh, have come with a soil and uh, there's a plastic cover. So I took that to Brazil and uh, a scientist affiliated with NASA gave me some uh, seeds to grow in here, and I planted those seeds. And so I was able every day, twice a day, I'd measure the width, uh, uh, the length and width of the leaves of the four different plants, the lettuce and the beans and so on that I planted in this. And that was my simple experiment. And that proved that the thicker the smoke, the more the plants grew, which is a completely unexpected finding until I realized that's the way plants work. When there's less sunlight, they produce larger leaves to collect what little sunlight there is. So another simple experiment you can do is testing bottled water for impurities. And this is easy to do because you can buy water test kits for, uh, that are used in aquariums. You can buy those at a pet store or at a Walmart. Uh, now that project may not win major awards, but guess what? When my daughter Vicky did that project, she was testing the water that we were uh, giving our, our, our youngest daughter, Sarah, when she was still an infant. And Vicky found that that water was loaded with ammonia well, that's not supposed to be in bottled water, but it was. We immediately stopped using that bottled water, but we would have continued doing it, using it, had Vicki not done that science fair project. So you never know what you might discover with your project. Sometimes a project can lead to an important scientific discovery. Uh, my daughter discovered living microbes in smoke arriving from Yucatan here in, to here in Central Texas, right out in this field. And for that project, she was uh, using glass microscope slides trying to collect dust from Asia dust arise from Asia over Texas, and in fact, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, uh, usually in May. And so she was setting out these microscope slides and collecting dust and so forth. And she, then she began collecting lots of fungal spores in this dust. And to make a long story short, it turned out it was not dust from Asia, it was smoke from Yucatan coming across the Gulf of Mexico. And she was collecting that smoke in the form of large black particles of, of carbon. And it was loaded with uh, bacteria and fungal spores or mole spores and when she finalized her project she built a kite or she didn't build a kite she built an air sampler to fly on a kite and she flew this over the Gulf of Mexico twice on a day with a lot of smoke from Yucatan and on a day with hardly any smoke from Yucatan and on the smoky day there are lots of black carbon particles on her microscope slide and lots of fungal spores on the clear day there were hardly any smoke particles just a few and hardly any fungal spores. So that project proved that the smoke was associated with the fungal spores, something that had not been discovered. That discovery was unexpected. No hypothesis would have predicted that. The question was, what will I find if I do this project? And she found that she'd made a major discovery. So do something original, and if you might make an, you might make an original discovery like Sarah did. Now, those are simple experiments. Sarah's project was considered simple. Advanced experiments, like my son's seismometer that detected uh, the earth movements by an optical fiber pendulum. One end of the fiber was connected to a light source, a bright LED, and then it was suspended with a lead weight, and then there was a light detector at the bottom. And so any movement of that lead weight would be detected at the bottom by the displacement of the optical fiber light from the, from the light detector. He detected earthquakes from all around the world, but it, his, his main awards were for detecting two underground nuclear tests in Nevada and here we are in Central Texas, and he detected those in his bedroom, not more than 100 feet from where I'm sitting. Sarah made her discovery in this field. So we have kind of a science relationship to the land that we live on. Those are ideas for simple experiments and advanced experiments. 
follow the rules. That's the next thing you have to consider. There are three main categories of science fair rules and they're designed to require honesty, safety, and appropriate supervision of you while you do your project. Honesty, that's the number one rule for the International Science and Engineering Fair. How tragic that that has to be number one. But unfortunately, there's a major problem. Too many high school kids cheat. Too many college kids cheat. So they've had to add this rule to prevent people who cheat on their projects from entering science fairs. And here's what, uh, here's what they say. International Science Fair rules, I'm quoting. Scientific fraud and misconduct are not condoned at any level of research or competition. This includes plagiarism, forgery, use or, or presentation of other researchers' work as one's own, and fabrication of data. Fraudulent projects will fail to qualify for competition at affiliated fairs and the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. The Society for Science and the Public reserves the right to revoke recognition of a project subsequently found to have been fraudulent. So the cheaters who are able to sneak through the system, if they're ever exposed, they lose their award. Sadly, this statement is necessary because various surveys have revealed that a majority of high school students have cheated at one time or another, some of them very, very frequently. The internet has made cheating and plagiarism much easier than ever before. I've edited two science magazines, and I remember distinctly the only cases of plagiarism, in other words, copying somebody's work, were when people copied articles directly off Wikipedia and claimed that they had written the article. And uh, what I did when I checked my articles, I put them through a plagiarism checker and I instantly found these cases where people had simply repeated something from the web. They didn't even acknowledge where they got it. Now, if they had simply put a, uh, if they copied a few sentences and said, source, Wikipedia, blah, 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 that would have been okay. But even Wikipedia copies things. So it's best to go to the original source and not depend on an aggregator site like Wikipedia. Now, one more thing about this. Uh, Kessler International is a consulting firm that uh, did massive interviews to determine how frequent che cheating is in college. And guess what? They found that many students believe that cheating is necessary just to survive college. And here's my response to that. Those students better hope that the pilot of the plane they're flying from one point to another didn't cheat on his or her pilot's exams. And they better hope if they visit a doctor and have to have surgery that the doctor didn't cheat on his or her exams in medical school before they operated on that person. So just keep that in mind and you will not be a cheater. Now, if you are a cheater or a plagiarist, if you do that in, if you do that in your class, take it a, make it a personal pledge right now, you're never gonna do it again. The professional sciences have too many cheaters as it is and we don't want any more, period. Now, safety, we got off cheating, let's talk about safety. Doing science in school for fun or professionally requires careful attention to safety rules. And never was that more apparent to me than when I went to a science fair that Vicky was, and my, both daughters, Vicky and Sarah, had entered. And two boys came in with a project, set up their board, and it was, a, it was a project involving internal combustion engines. After they set up their board, they came, their project board, they came back in with a bottle of gasoline without a lid on it, open gasoline. I was stunned. Gasoline is extremely dangerous. And if somebody had just, a spark could have ignited that container of gasoline and badly burned both of those young boys. So I explained that to them. I explained it very quickly. Said, please take that out of this building immediately. And they did. And they found a distant place and they dumped our gasoline. But basic safety is not only required, it's just common sense. Don't do anything in a science project that might endanger you or others or the subjects of your science fair project. Now every year, some students don't do that and they, can't, they, they, they pass their high school science fair, they become an award winner maybe, but when they try to go to the international uh, science, affiliated, science fair affiliated fair, like a regional fair, they don't get admitted because they haven't followed the safety rules. Then number three, supervision. Uh, the rules require that certain projects be supervised. A good example of that is rules involving human subjects. So if I wanted to measure the pulse rate of uh, 12 kids, uh, say six boys and six girls, after they had run 100 yards, uh, I would need to have medical permission to do that. Otherwise, I'm abusing those, those students. And I've done a lot of science projects involving kids before I knew about that rule. But that, that, that rule is very important because it protects people from being improperly used in a science project. So be sure you've read the rules. Make sure you followed all the forms, that they're properly signed, properly dated, and that none of, this, none of it's been fabricated. Everything is honest.